Welcome to our podcast, A Novel Talk, co-hosted by Carl Lee, and I'm Wendy Kendall. My mystery book, Cat Out of the Bag, that's cat with a K, is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, bookshop.org, and all over. Catherine Watson, an international purse designer and amateur sleuth, is challenged to do the impossible for her friend as she's faced with a puzzling mystery in her hometown of Bayside. Thank you to all the readers who've let me know how much they enjoyed the book. And now available, the prequel, Perstachio Makes a Splash. Catherine and Mayor Brenda Durling investigate a chilling cold case. And here is your co-host. Thanks, Wendy. Hi, my name is Carl Lee, and I write paranormal fantasy. My current project, Selfies, explores the question, what if hell ran a social media site? Oh. My my connection to paranormal it makes me very excited about this week's guest. Wendy? Oh, yes. Our guest today is Carrie Blaisdell, storyteller. She's the best-selling and award-winning author of paranormal, historical mystery, and romantic fiction. This author likes surprising her readers, and she's fascinated with the other. Ghosts? psychic powers, mythological beings, and with human relationships and interactions. She loves history and how it connects with and influences our present and future. And she loves a good mystery. I certainly agree with that. There's breaking news for her urban fantasy, The Dead series. Waking the Dead is following in its big sister's Footsteps, the Big Sisters debriefing the dead. Not only is it in the 2020 Rhone Finals for Best Paranormal, Long, but it's also a Royal Palm Literary Award finalist for Best Published Fantasy. Both those award ceremonies are in October. Best of luck, Carrie, and thank you for joining us on A Novel Talk with Carrie Blaisdell. Thanks so much for having me. Um, October is coming really fast, and I don't have any fingernails left because I've been nail biting them. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. Thanks for that, Carrie. And good luck with uh, your October events. I can understand the nail biting. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Thanks, Carrie. The setting in your novel, Debriefing the Dead, they're so detailed and so unique. What prompted you to base your story around the Mediterranean? Wishful, wishful trip thinking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that little, there's a little bit of armchair traveler in me. Um, you know, it's one of those weird things where I did not consciously think to myself, hmm, I would like to set a story that starts in France and goes to Turkey and yada, yada. Um, I honestly, I started writing and it just sort of came out that my heroine owned an antique shop and it just happened to be in Marseille, France. And then the story started and I didn't even know she was going to leave France. And then everything, all these things started happening and it turned out she had to go to Turkey. So it was just kind of, you know, I, I, I vacillate between extreme pantsing, in other words, writing by the seat of my pants, which is how I wrote this book. I'm right there. And then also ex- extreme plotting, which, I, which I've done for other books. But this book, it just all sort of came out. <laughs> In Debriefing the Dead, your surprising character, Eric, has a warning for your protagonist. The truth will always come out whether we want it to or not. Can you tell us a little about the intrigue of secrets in this story? Sure, and I'm I'm trying to do it without any sort of spoilers towards the end. Um, Let's just say that my main character, Hyacinth, kind of... She thinks she knows what's going on in the world, and she also thinks she knows what's going on with her friends and in her life. And it, it kind of turns out that every single thing she thought was one way, it turns out to be another way. She, um, yeah, literally everything just kind of gets turned upside down for her. Without including the. Go ahead. 
I was just going to say, inclu- including, including, you know, like the guy that she thinks is one of her best friends. Um, turns out he has uh, some very mysterious secrets as well. So, mm-hmm. without giving away any spoilers, and speaking of Eric. What compelled him to stay with Hyacinth, even though he had numerous opportunities to move on? You know, and that's another thing. That's So um, this is the book we're talking about is book one in the series. And mm-hmm. Eric's character really starts to evolve in book two. And there's going to be a book three. Um, so it's it's not so much that he consciously tries to stay with her. It's more uh, of an unconscious, something's, something's keeping him on earth and we don't quite know what that is. We don't know why he sticks with Hyacinth. Um, it isn't a conscious choice on his part, at least not at first. Later it becomes maybe a conscious choice, uh, but he, he's got something that ties him here and we don't know what that is yet. Excellent. Your protagonist, Hyacinth Finch, is, I love that name, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> she, <laughs> she is driven to page turning extremes to try and save a special seven year old boy. Can you tell us about your character, Jordy? Yes, Jordy is Hyacinth's nephew. Uh, he's the son of her sister, Lily, who uh, at the beginning of the book is going through a this is not a spoiler because it happens right away, but a very contentious divorce uh, from her from her scumbag, soon to be ex husband, who is a member of the Sicilian mob. And Jordy is, you know, Hyacinth is she's unmarried. She's not involved with anybody, and Jordy is pretty much the light of her life. Um, and she would do she would literally die for him and do anything for him. Um, and. It, uh, stuff happens pretty early on where she ends up having to actually take care of him and then like I said everything just sort of turns upside down and sort of the only thing that she's got going is she needs to protect Jordy and she needs to keep him safe and she will do whatever it takes to make that happen he seems like he's such a smart little kid too I just really <laughs> I kind of you know I, I wanted to help him, too, you know, through the book. <laughs> well, good. That's most good. seven-year-old Most seven-year-old boys are very smart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hyacinth, is such, Hyacinth is such a fascinating character um, with her conflicted uh, ethics and morality. Um, she's so multifaceted, fiercely loyal to friends and family who are, clo- uh, who are close to um, on the one hand, yet ready to bend, twist, and break the rules or laws uh, when it suits her on the other. Um, how do these aspects of her personality reflect and contrast those of her brother-in-law, Nick? Ah, uh, yes. So Nick is the scumbag, soon-to-be ex-husband that I was just talking about. I think the difference between them is, because you're right, Hyacinth is perfectly willing to break into somebody's house and steal artwork or, you know, fudge around with with various international laws and and things like that. But I think the difference is that she's not bad to be bad. She doesn't break the rules just to break the rules and and be bad. Um, It's usually she's doing it for for either for a a good purpose, like a higher purpose, or she's doing it, like you said, because it's the only choice she has Mm -hmm. to protect somebody that she loves. Um, Whereas with Nick, um, being a member of the mob and just being not a just a not nice guy. Like even if he wasn't in the mob, he would just not be a nice guy. Um, he when he's breaking a rule or breaking the law, it, it's not for a good purpose. It's never for a good purpose. Loyalty in people is such an interesting theme in your book. Can you talk a little about the positive loyal people? And then in contrast, the blind loyalty of the Iagardi and also the Rousseau. Yeah, so we we did talk a little bit already about how Hyacinth is just like, you know, once once you're in her inner circle, she is going to do everything for you. She's going to, you know, take care of you and fight for you and and do everything. 
Um, but it isn't blind. You're right. Like, you know, she she's going into stuff with her eyes wide open. And um, and like I said, you know, there's there's a purpose there. The Diaguardis is the is the mob family that Nick belongs to. And pretty much the you know, it it's just like you would imagine where there's there's the higher ups and then there's the grunts and the grunts are going to do whatever they're told to do because they're in that life and they don't you know they either don't feel like they have a choice or they don't care that they don't have a choice um the russo i don't want to spoil too much about what the the russos are like um but they they also have um a very definite loyalty to to their boss and um they they'll do anything that he tells them to do and that's just it you know yeah um you you center a large part of the story around uh legends with a uh, specific religious aspect um is this based on actual turkish lore or is it something you created full cell on your own um, I did not know. I didn't create it at all. It's um, the stuff that came out as I was writing the book. They're actually biblical legends. Um, so some of them may actually be in the Bible. I, I freely admit I have not read the Bible cover to cover, so <laughs> I don't know for sure. But they are they are um, bound up with very early, uh, early Christianity. Um, and they are... Um, stories of things that that happened in turkey but they are part of the christian religious um what's the word i'm looking for you know cadre so um yeah and it, this like i said this book was i it almost none of this book was conscious like it's not like i said i'm gonna do this 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 and this it, i right. started writing right. and then i started to research one thing and then i went down some giant rabbit hole and came out the other side with a book so it's like i don't know what happened is something happened to that rabbit hole and out came the book <laughs> i'd love to find that rabbit hole it was wonderful yeah <laughs> yeah that is so cool <laughs> I, I really enjoyed all of Debriefing the Dead so very much. Among all of the great scenes that you gave us, you have an amazing scene full of action and terror and pain and crowds that are crazed into a frenzy when we're afraid that the dead will abduct Eric and do him harm. Can you talk about the skills it takes as an author to write such a climactic scene in such a very visual way? So that's something, um, and I, I don't know that like every author is like this, but I'm a very, I'm actually a very visual person. Um, I, I do a lot of my own like graphics and things for social media. I was a graphic designer for many years and I think very visually. So I think that's part of it is that I just, I see it in my head. But I think the other part is that another thing about this book was a lot of it, I was sort of writing almost as if I was Hyacinth. So as I was trying to see what she saw, and then if she like if she didn't know what was going on, I didn't know what was going on. So it was sort of almost like I was just channeling her experiences as I was writing it, and then at the same time, sort of bringing that that very visualization aspect of my own personality into the writing. So um, I, I'm glad that I'm glad that you experienced it very visually. <laughs> Yes, I really did, that, and that that's interesting. I, I I like I like hearing the technique behind it. That that's fascinating. Yes, uh, detect, experienced it visually or viscerally, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, I I held my I was holding my breath several times throughout the book, and that was one uh, very specific time that I awesome. Uh, was that's that's great to that hear. Way. Thank you. Um, earlier. Wendy asked you about loyalty, uh, and that's important throughout the book, uh, but so is trust. Um, can you talk about how Hy uh, Hyacinth, Jason, and Eric's lack of trust for each other hampered their mission without giving anything away, of course? <laughs> yeah, well, see, that's that's the thing is that um, 
Hyacinth, you know, that's what I was saying a little bit earlier, too, is that, you know, she sort of she thinks she knows who she can trust. Like she's she's almost like she's a little complacent at the start of the book. She's like, I've got my life. I know who I am. I know what's going on. And I know, you know, who my peeps are. Uh, And then it kind of like she starts to find out that she really doesn't know basically anything. And that's that's kind of hard to recover from. I mean, I've had a few things happen in my personal life where something like that, something similar has happened where either somebody that I thought was my, you know, really close friend did something or whatever. And it's, it's very damaging. You you start to not trust yourself Mm -hmm. when that happens. Mm -hmm. And then when you can't trust yourself, it's even harder to trust other people. So even if the person that, that did it is, you know, sorry, and you've forgiven them and all these things, it makes it very difficult to kind of reestablish that relationship and that trust. And, you know, again, without spoiling anything, the stuff that happens at the beginning of the book is so, like, so far out of left field for Hyacinth that, you know, she kind of, she kind of comes out of it almost like not sure she'll ever trust anybody again, because everything she thought was one way was not that way. So um, it definitely makes it harder. And, um, you know, there are there are times when it's good to, to be mistrustful. And then there are times where you just got to take that leap. And that's what she's struggling with is like, do I take that leap? Or do I do I actually say, well, wait a minute, I got burned a minute ago. You know, is that going to yeah. happen again? Yeah. So. When you were writing the Dead series and, and you're still writing it, what aspect of research in particular have you really enjoyed doing? I saw that question. I started to laugh because really it's kind of all of it. <laughs> that, it well, it, it, it's, it's, it is that rabbit hole. It is that sort of black hole of I could actually sit there and research all day, but then I wouldn't get any writing done. So um, I just I have a background in in comparative literature. My degree is in comparative literature and the my um, thesis I didn't go as far as a master's, I only have a BA, but my thesis was on like the very, 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 very early Arthurian literature. So like the the myths that started somewhere around the eighth or ninth century in Wales. And I'm just fascinated by history, by uh, mythology and legends and lore. And um, so I could research all day, like like I could just, I could keep going. Um, But, and in fact, actually when I originally envisioned this series it was going to be three books that was it cold hard stop three books i've got so many bits and pieces of of research now collected in my head that i'm like ooh, that would be good for a story that would be good and you know honestly i could probably write like i don't know how many more books but I'm, at least I've, the third one's almost done and there's going to be at least a fourth but beyond that i don't know <laughs> well we can't wait speaking of we can't wait um I know our listeners can't wait to hear an excerpt from the book. Would you mind reading something for us? Sure. And um, again, I will, I'm just, I'm just going to set this up, but try and set it up without spoiling too much. Um, this is a part in the story. It's it's early on in the story. And um, she has just, um, she runs an antique shop in Marseille and she kept something uh, from these guys who were looking for it and she didn't tell them she had it and they found out she had it anyway and um, and in the middle of sort of them finding out that she kept it from them her sister has shown up with her nephew uh, and they are currently being held hostage back at the um, antique shop while Hyacinth has been taken to go get this item that she kept from, from these guys so um, that's kind of a little bit of the setup here so This is when she's actually, she's um, got her item and she's heading back to the antique shop, so. Now that I had two badasses instead of one dragging me all over Marseille, there was no way we'd fit in the pea pod. In theory, it's a four-seater, but in reality, the only person who fits in the back is Jordy, and at seven, even he's getting too big. Luckily, Nick had a decent-sized BMW. Not as nice as the Maybach, but big enough for Claude to sit in the back while Nick drove one-handed, training the gun on me in the passenger seat. Mr. Macho. Of course he'd pop for the leather interior. Besides not eating meat, I also don't wear animals or support making them into furniture. Nick's coat was bad enough, but at least I wasn't forced to touch it. Luckily, the trip was short and I didn't get too nauseous. 
Unluckily, no fleeks with lights flashing and sirens blaring magically appeared along the route, so either Jason didn't get the message or the cops didn't believe him, which left me with nothing. I got out of Nick's car, retrieving the rock from the floor, and Nick and Claude followed me into the shop. Jacques looked up when he heard the bell, his impassive black gaze immediately going to the canvas bundle clutched in my hands. As near as I could tell, the two drivers were in the exact same positions as when we'd left 30 minutes ago, but Lily and Jordy had moved, now huddling against the front of the counter, quiet if not calm. Relief washed over Lily's face when she saw me, and Jordy sat up straighter, trying to be brave. My heart broke to see them. Surely the Russo could let us go. I hadn't witnessed anything illegal and wouldn't call the police if I had. But my limited knowledge of evil was that it annihilated first and asked questions, well, never. We found it, Claude announced, and something else. Hi, honey, I'm home, Nick growled, hot on Claude's heels. Apparently, he was stupider than I thought. He walked right into the shop with no idea what the situation was, gun out, thinking he'd grab Lily and Jordy and go. Lily had other ideas. She took one look at him, screamed louder than the rock had, then grabbed Jordy and dove behind the counter. Nick roared and dove after them as they scrambled toward the back of the store. Neither the Russo nor their thugs seemed disturbed by any of this. Jacques walked to me and gently removed my burden. He shook the covering loose, careful not to touch the rock's surface with his thin, elegant fingers then exhaled sharply. For my part, I felt a strange regret, an emptiness that the rock was no longer mine. I thought I heard it give a faint wail as though it missed me. Lily and Jordy rounded the the counter, Nick close behind, and without looking up, Jacques murmured to no one in particular, Tuele, kill them. The truck driver aimed and fired at Nick's head, killing him instantly, his body dropping to the floor. Lily screamed and hid Jordy's face, and I ran to them, shouting, Go! Out the back! Now! I pushed and shoved, herding them forward, knowing the driver must be taking aim again. If I could get them out the door, maybe they'd be safe. Lily wrenched the knob open. Improbably, Jason was on the other side. Take him, she shrieked, shoving a frantic Jordy into his arms. Jason took one look at us and scooped Jordy up, then hauled ass down the alley and around the corner. Lily was out the door, me right behind, and still no other shots were fired. We started to run, and I realized why we weren't shot inside. There, it was crowded and dark. Out here, even in the waning light, we were sitting, or running, ducks. We'd made it about halfway up the block when I finally heard the gun silencer go off. A bullet whizzed past my cheek and hit Lily's leg. She started to fall, and another went into the back of her head. I screamed, and then something hit my own back between my shoulder blades. I'd like to tell you what I felt or saw or thought in that instant, but I don't remember much. I don't think there was any pain, but I did know I was shot. I might even have seen the bullet exiting through my chest, but I could be imagining that part. All I know is suddenly my legs didn't work. They felt heavy and rubbery, and no matter how I focused, I couldn't control them. My arms were next, then my vision dimmed. Then all thoughts started to drain away like liquid from a broken vessel. I crumpled to the ground, but didn't feel the impact. I lay there a moment, maybe two, while my heart pumped blood through arteries that could no longer contain it. And then I died. Wow. Thank you, Carrie, for the reading. That was that was as dramatic, if not more dramatic than when I read it the first time. Um, It. it is a great series. It is a great uh, start to a series, and I can't wait to read the next one. Wendy, awesome. <laughs> yes, thank you for the reading, boy. That really gives your listener, our listeners, a taste of what they're in store for with this great book. And thank you so much for joining us for a novel talk. We are wishing you all the best for your awards in October. Good luck. And <laughs> thank you. So- Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. And listeners, you will want to check out Carrie's website, carrieblaisdell.com, K-E-R-R-Y-B-L-A-I-S-D-E-L-L.com. And a thank you to our listeners for tuning in. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss an episode, and keep reading because a novel read leads to a novel talk.